Professor uh, Jean-Michel Gillet, uh, since 1989 to 1992, Jean-Michel worked uh, on his doctorate in physics under supervision of Professor Pierre Becker at Sorbonne uh, University um, in the lab now known as the Institute for Mineralogy, Physics uh, and uh, Materials and, and uh, uh, Physics of Materials and, and Cosmochemistry. The PhD thesis uh, dealt with an ab initio computing of electron density under electric fields, and most importantly, a wave function refinement from uh, Campton scattering data. Then Jean-Michel went uh, for his postdoc uh, since 1992 to 1993 with Jerry Hastings and Kai Chang Kao at the National Synchrotron Light Source uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory USA. Uh, since 1993 um, to 1995, uh, Jean-Michel was an assistant professor uh, at the Paris East uh, University. Uh, since 1995 uh, to, to uh, 2004, uh, assistant professors, uh, professor at the Ecole Centrale Paris. Uh, since 2004 uh, up to today, a full professor at Ecole Centrale Paris now known as Central Superlex, University of Paris Saclay. Uh, he's the head of the physics department um, uh, of Central Superlex uh, uh, and chair, uh, and uh, um, Jean Michel was the chair of the Quantum Crystallography Commission of the IUCR, um, uh, and that was uh, in the period from uh, 2016 to 2021. 20, uh, um, Professor Gillet teaches three courses um, at different levels on, on quantum, uh, um, uh, quantum physics and quantum and statistical physics. He wrote excellent books and, and, uh, on, on the solid state physics and participates in multidisciplinary course based on X-ray synchrotron beamline design. Uh, Professor Jean-Michel Gillet is the author of the book entitled uh, Application-Driven Quantum and Statistical uh, Physics, a short course uh, for future scientists and engineers. Uh, volume, uh, volume 1, Foundations, Volume 2, Equilibrium, which was published by World Scientific uh, in the series Essential Textbooks in Physics. Uh, Jean-Michel will talk today on phase uh, space um, quantum crystallography, um, how about considering the other axis? Jean-Michel, the screen is yours. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. The pointer, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So, dear Paulina and Christophe, uh, thanks uh, a lot for the invitation and this very thorough introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I believe uh, today you expect us to put the spotlight onto the density matrix business. My part will be limited to the relationship between the one electron reduced density matrix and the experimental techniques, or at least those techniques which are the, the most relevant for the determination of the density matrix. Um, I understand that the goal is not for us to talk to the usual suspects of the quantum crystallography community. Uh, I, I want to speak mostly to the young or not so young researchers who are curious to discover what phase-based quantum crystallography is about. So I'm not going to dwell upon technical details. It is only in the very last part that I will present uh, the latest progress of our collaboration. So when it becomes a little too technical, uh, rest assured that it won't last because it will be the sign that the talk is coming to an end. Uh, so to get started on the firm basis, uh, I will provide elementary definitions to position the density matrix within the framework of quantum crystallography or quantum physics, or even physics in the broad sense, since it will be all about phase space. Uh, we will then consider both sets of axes of phase space, one after the other. In part two, I will start with 
positions of space. It is the position space which has clearly dominated quantum physics by head and shoulders since the early days. Um, then I will spend more time uh, accompanying you through the too often neglected momentum part of um, phase space. This is no new knowledge, and I'll explain uh, in the fourth part uh, that the idea of combining information from position and momentum space uh, can be traced back to the 1990s. Um, I will then conclude by showing you how this can be done today and how far we've been with one particle density matrix reconstruction during the, the, the past few years. Uh, okay, um, so since our early age and first steps in physics, we've been told that at a given time, uh, the state of a system is totally defined by the, the position and momentum of each uh, of its components. Um, the state is given by a point in the so-called phase space. Uh, but in the 20th century and the advent of quantum physics, um, uh, the, the, this century uh, significantly traumatized the, the phase space. The, the position and momentum parameters became uh, observables represented by incompatible operators. One can only speak about uh, position probability uh, density and momentum probability density, but there is no such thing as a probability of being at some point in phase space. The closer uh, we can get to uh, the old classical picture in phase space uh, is through uh, the Wigner function. Uh, this function indeed depends on position and momentum coordinates, but it cannot play the role of a probability. One major obstacle is that it is not positive definite. Uh, the neat aspect which tells us that phase space didn't go totally down the drain with the birth of quantum physics is that if one integrates uh, the Wigner function over all position subspace, one obtains uh, the momentum space probability density and vice versa. But here, uh, the Wigner function is not a classical object. It is completely determined by the wave function of the system. So imagine we have a single electron to start with. We can take uh, the Fourier transform of the Wigner function with respect to the momentum variable. Now we are completely in the position space representation of the problem, of course. Uh, the function we have obtained is the density matrix for this electron. So speaking of the density matrix or the Wigner function is equivalent. It is a mere choice of axis representation. For y equals zero, um, this is equivalent to integrating over uh, momentum. So we get the uh, position density. Now uh, we have a function which can be seen as a continuous matrix. Its rows and columns um, correspond to possible positions. Its diagonal is the position space electron density. To get the momentum density is a little trickier. We need to integrate over position x and Fourier transform back the y coordinate. Um, rest assured, there is another way to look at it. Uh, it starts from the n electron wave function. So here we are talking about a pure quantum state, hence the index j. Um, of course, no one really needs uh, an electron wave function, since all known useful quantum observables only involve at most two particles at a time. Expectation values from a quantum state only require information on an electron pair. So Dirac and von Neumann and others agreed to simplify by construction this quantity by tracing out all electrons except a pair. And this is the two particles uh, reduced density matrix. 
And I'm confident that Cartesina will have plenty to say about that object. In what follows, I will be even more drastic since I will retain only a, a, a single electron. Um, since to this day, uh, there is too little that experiments can teach us about the two particle density matrix. Thus, we end up with the one electron reduced density matrix, one RDM. Um, although I'm, uh, I, we're not going to use it here, uh, this provides us also a relationship between the wave function and the Wigner function. Uh, moreover, real electron systems are seldom in a pure quantum state. Therefore, predicting observable values often requires that a statistical mixture of states be considered. Okay, um, that's, the, that's it for, for the most formal approach to um, density matrices. Now, the question I'd like to discuss is whether there is any hope that this density matrix, this one particle density matrix, can be derived from experimental data. Um, as it's been explained on numerous occasions, and particularly in this series of lectures, uh, quantum crystallography can be considered as a happy collateral outcome of a long-lasting controversy, and the controversy on the dual wave corpuscular nature of the photon. Shortly before he passed away, Henri Poincaré stated that the work of Laue should be considered as the most important of modern physics at that time, of course. Uh, Poincaré was referring to the fact that Max von Laue, together with Nipping and Friedrich, um, had indeed killed two colorful birds with one stone or one experiment. And with this single experiment, that owed Laue uh, the 1912 Nobel Prize in Physics, Laue confirmed that uh, what had been the, the intuition of many scientists, that crystals are indeed a periodic array of atoms. Okay. But the other bird that Laue and his collaborators killed uh, was no less colorful. Uh, they brilliantly proved that an interference effect was at work. Therefore, X-rays could now quite legitimately be described as a, a very high frequency electromagnetic wave. And this almost put an end to a long but fruitful debate between William Henry Bragg and Charles Barkler about the nature of X-rays. Oddly, uh, as busy uh, as they were fighting each other arguments and experimental results, neither uh, William Henry Bragg nor Barclay uh, made any reference to Einstein's 1905 paper on photoelectric effect. But th this dispute was nevertheless very fruitful since it led to the discovery of X-ray fluorescence characteristic lines by Barclay. Barclay was in favor of the wave nature of X-rays and the discovery of K and L fluorescence lines earned Barclay the 1917 uh, Nobel Prize. But William Henry Bragg argued in favor of X-rays as neutral corpuscles. He kept designing new setups for their fine detailed analysis. And we know that his expertise in building very accurate uh, X-ray sp spectrometers led him and his son, Lawrence, William Lawrence, uh, to be awarded the 1914 Nobel Prize in Physics for demonstrating the usefulness of X-rays for crystal structure determination. Consequently, it is rather ironic to think that Bragg was proved wrong concerning the nature of X-rays against Barclay by a diffraction experiment less than a decade before Barclay was proved wrong against Compton in another experiment uh, demonstrating that X-rays could also behave as neutral particles. Um, perhaps even more amusing is that the, the same year, Compton published the famous groundbreaking interpretation of his X-rays in elastic scattering experiments in terms of billiard ball collisions. Uh, he published another paper 
on X-ray total reflection, which was clearly building on the electromagnetic wave behavior of the very same radiation. Well, I, I will get back to Compton's experiment later. For now, let's return to uh, the consequence of the 1912 uh, diffraction experiment. Uh, quickly, very bright scientists such as De Bois and, or Compton uh, suggested that it was possible uh, or, or, or it was a, a possible way uh, to reach the electron distribution around the nuclei. And on the same page of the Nature Journal where Compton made this statement, in an immediate response, um, William Henry Bragg put forward the, the Fourier analysis as a mean for extracting information on the electron density. And uh, I will skip uh, the, the long history of, of uh, electron density reconstruction in position space uh, because this has been told many times. Uh, I will now make only reference to those episodes which are related to density matrix determination. Um, to my best knowledge, people started uh, getting interested into uh, the pos pos possible determination of the world particle density matrix when Clinton and collaborators published a, a series of papers in 1969. They built on an expression discussed by uh, Lovedin in 1955. Uh, the principle uh, is as follows. We uh, choose uh, a basis set of well-behaving functions, for example, uh, a set of atomic orbitals, and we find the optimal population matrix P uh, compatible with the, the density. Of course, uh, this is not uh, an easy task since even if we had an infinite set of structure factors, we would only have an exact access to the diagonal of the one particle density matrix. But if we claim uh, to get a, a pertinent density matrix, we need to make sure that this matrix is related to uh, an electron wave function or a mixture of uh, pure state functions. This is called the n-representability problem. Uh, while it's been shown that, uh, by, by Gilbert in 75, 1975, that any normalized positive definite density function is unrepresentable. There is a set of conditions uh, for the one particle density matrix. The trace uh, should be um, the total number of electrons and the eigenvalues should be between zero and one. Uh, but if one assumes a pure state represented by a single determinant, then the eigenvalues are either one or zero. Uh, this is enough to, to seek for only density matrices which fulfill the idempotency condition, uh, which is basically gamma square equals gamma. As an example, um, this method has been applied by Howard and co-workers. Uh, unfortunately, they did not really consider the matrix. Only the diagonal is discussed in, uh, in their paper using a data set of about 2000 X-ray reflections. They compare on, on this figure, uh, the Laplacian of the density uh, obtained using the hansen koppens model and using or using the idempotent 1RDM refinement. And uh, there is also this paper by Snyder and Stevens. Again, they use the idempotency constraint, and even if their concern uh, was again limited to the diagonal of the density matrix. Actually, uh, in the 1990s, things had already started to evolve in a new dimension for density matrices. For example, there is a paper by Schwartz and Muller, where they consider the reconstruction of the density matrix from the density. Obviously, uh, uh, stated this way, um, it is an awkward challenge to aim at recovering a full matrix only from its diagonal. And their conclusion uh, make a, a lot of sense. They claim that there is little hope to retrieve a high quality density matrix, but for 
isolated atoms, and only if the idempotency constraint is applied. Yet, um, they add that one should consider, uh, I quote here, uh, additional experimental information, for instance, momentum density distribution, which has, however, not been sufficiently investigated so far. So this is the axis, the missing axis. So where is this momentum density distribution coming from? Uh, how can it help uh, with the density matrix problem? Uh, to see this, uh, let's move on to um, the momentum part of phase space. We have all been told that uh, the real confirmation of the photon as a quantum particle of light was brought by the Compton experiment. Arthur Compton was awarded with uh, C.T. Wilson the 1927 Nobel Prize for, I quote, um, the discovery of the effect named after him. Well, that's not very informative, is it? Um, what he was awarded for is the discovery of what is now called the Compton shift. The fact that when X-rays or gamma rays are scattered from a target, in addition to the normal uh, Thomson scattering, uh, there is a low frequency component in the scattered uh, intensity. And the reduction in frequency only depends on the geometry of the scattering, not the nature of the target. Uh, the interpretation in terms of particles of light colliding with electrons was published almost uh, simultaneously by Dubai and Compton. Uh, but today's most useful um, is uh, the, the most useful part uh, is what is now called the Doppler broadening of the Compton spectrum. The fact that this shifted peak is more like a, a, a bump uh, with some characteristic width. And the physical interpretation of this bump in terms of electron speed in the target is due to uh, Jesse uh, Demont. So uh, a Compton scattering spectrum uh, looks like this. We have uh, the elastic lines, which correspond to the incident beam energy and shifted to lower energies is what is called the Compton profile. If uh, electrons were all at rest, this profile here would be very narrow but centered on the same shifted energy. But to obtain a clean spectrum, significantly better, this one, uh, from that obtained by Compton or Dumont, one really needs a very good energy resolution. So it wasn't before uh, the mid-60s uh, that uh, Dick Weiss in the US and Malcolm Cooper in UK uh, could obtain Compton uh, spectra with good enough quality. And um, as Malcolm said on several occasions, um, Weiss became increasingly interested in the Compton technique when he realized how different it is from X-ray diffraction. Um, first, it is an inelastic process, which can be performed at very high energies. Consequently, uh, absorption is usually no longer a problem. Second, it is an incoherent process. Thus, the crystal quality is usually not an issue. There is no extinction to worry about. Um, multiple scattering can be corrected for. However, um, as an incoherent process, the scattering cross-section is much weaker than for X-ray diffraction. So statistics can be an issue. We can thus easily understand how important the development of high intensity photon sources, um, uh, such as the synchrotron radiation, uh, how it's been important to uh, the, the, the content scattering community. What we now call uh, is um, um, incoherent inelastic scattering when photon electron collision process is accompanied by large momentum and energy transfer. Basically, the electron is immediately kicked out and converted to 
perfectly free particle. This is the so-called impulse approximation formalized by Peter Eisenberger and Phil Platzman in 1970. Uh, under this approximation, uh, the corresponding profile is directly proportional to the, um, uh, the electron marginal probability density in momentum space. What I mean by that is that it is the probability density that the electron momentum vector can have a particular value for a given component, regardless of the other two components. Um, Compton profiles thus have more signal for slow electrons, uh, those which are the most delocalized in position space, precisely those diffuse electrons which are difficult to see with diffraction experiments. Uh, as a famous example, I can mention the work uh, Weiss conducted on magnesium oxide in, mon in momentum space. He argues that only 111 X-ray diffraction structure factors have significant valence electron contribution. And here demonstrates how easy it is to distinguish the ionic state from the neutral state by a mere comparison of uh, quantum profiles. So people started um, to explore the possibility of using higher energy photons from radioactive sources, uh, which solve, of course, the absorption problem, uh, satisf satisfy the impulse approximation and significantly improve the quality of the spectra. Uh, they could start studying uh, the inosotropy of momentum space. In this example, for uh, um, uh, Reed and Eisenberger compared the momentum distribution in diamond, silicon, and germanium in the 110 and the 111 direction, taking the 100 direction as a reference. So taking such differences has become common practice since this removes most systematic errors. Um, for example, in 1995, with Pierre Becker and Geneviève Lupias, we refined a wave function model from a set of directional quantum profiles for lithium hydrate. And from the inosotropy, which are plotted here, uh, it is clear uh, that um, the, the completely ionic model does not hold water. A, a slight coherent mixing between both neighboring atomic sites in the wave function is necessary to reproduce the momentum space results. Uh, another base, te uh, difference, base technique is uh, to compare the momentum space density as obtained from Compton data for samples with different uh, or slightly uh, different stoichiometry. Okay, so, so, so what about density matrices? There had been um, an attempt uh, to use momentum space information by Pecora in 1986 uh, from positron annihilation measurements. Here again, he finds that the data uh, need to be supplemented with um, the classic idempotency constraint and the results are not totally convincing. Um, so we need combination. And um, Vol Weirich and Vedin Smith uh, started uh, a collaboration with Hartmut Schmida in the early 90s, 1990s. Uh, they produced a, a series of uh, important papers with the clear goal to make better use of both momentum and position spaces. And they developed new strategies to uh, reconstruct uh, a density matrix that do not necessitate to restrict the model to the idempotent paradigm. The method put forward by Schmieder and co-workers is to start from an initial decent uh, density matrix expressed in a fixed basis set. Then they apply a series of unitary transformations so that it is easier to preserve the initial N representability. Therefore, what is really refined here is the unitary transformation matrix. Um, to my knowledge, this 1990 paper is the first attempt to conduct 
the one RDM, the one matrix uh, refinement using structure factors and Compton profiles information. And on those pictures, it is very is instructive to observe how the joint use of both type of experiments makes a difference. Uh, even more convincing results were published uh, in the following years. Take this example from the 1993 paper, where the authors give a, a representation of the density matrix for an isolated neon atom after refinement against Bragg and Compton data. And one can clearly see all the benefits of including both position and momentum space data in this last figure. Uh, I must indicate that for this joint model here, there is a, a new element. While preserving the N representability, uh, the one matrix is no longer forced to be idempotent. It can be seen on, on the other example they give uh, with a different basis set though. Unfortunately, uh, these promising results were not pursued even if Wolf Eilish mentions it in one of his last papers, but I haven't been able to trace it. Um, so let me come to the status of our own effort to recover a, a density matrix uh, beyond the isolate atom case. At the beginning of uh, the century, uh, Pierre Becker, Pietro Cartona, and myself have also experienced the difficult challenge of deriving what we could have called a density matrix. We formulated the problem in terms of a valence wave function model for the magnesium oxide crystal. We used a set of six convergent electron beam diffraction structure factors and a set of eight directional Compton profiles. The model was quite crude, but still, the final fit uh, was overall uh, satisfactory. Um, then we really started to get interested in density matrices and their determina determination from scattering data. My first attempt was reported in this uh, 2000 paper where uh, N representativity was only checked after refinement. Um, to ensure uh, an representable model, the first uh, attempts were merely an exploration of how we could manage by juggling with only the occupation numbers on pre-computed molecular orbitals. Um, for this uh, toy model, we looked at unpaired electrons. This would obviously uh, be the case for a, a true magnetic system for which we would have to consider uh, using polarized neutron diffraction data and magnetic Compton profiles. Again, um, the comparison between the initial density matrix and that obtained after refinement shows um, uh, the improvement both on the diagonal of the matrix but also um, uh, outside the diagonal with a good description of the coherent contribution uh, between uh, different sites. Uh, as shown on the right now, um, this is not an agreement that one could achieve uh, from only bright scattering data. Um, in recent years, starting with the undergrad work of Benjamin de Bruyne then with Johan Lone, and continuing today with Sishu Yu for his PhD work, we have developed a, a new procedure. It is based on a semi-definite programming approach to speed up the refinement of a, a one particle density, uh, one density matrix model with N representability constraints, still against data uh, from positions and momentum subspaces. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, the method is as follows. Uh, we fix a basis set, which we will later ad uh, adjust, but it is fixed for the moment. The basis functions are orthogonalized. 
uh, making it easier to uh, formulate the optimization problem with respect to the population nations. Um, ob uh, observables, um, and the matrix elements of the observables, uh, are, are thus uh, pre-computed so that the model structure factor uh, and Compton profiles um, can be expressed in terms of traces of the product of observable operators with the model population matrix. Um, a a, a, a chi-square uh, or chi-square-like objective function is constructed so that the minimi minimization procedure can be expressed with n representability constraint uh, imposed on, on the refined population, uh, population matrix. Um, well, the, the semi-definite uh, programming approach requires a slightly different formulation of the problem where actually one minimizes a, a dummy function and transfers the least square objective function into the constraint, which can be expressed as a simple uh, positive definite matrix. The procedure um, is quite efficient and robust. The first test were conducting on, on carbon dioxide. And apart from uh, the second neighbor's terms of the density matrix, a good quality reconstruction is achieved. And this is the reference for comparison. Um, one, one could question the, the relevance of, of this approach when real data are used. We are not at this stage yet. But Johan Luna is considered what happens if uh, data are polluted with realistic statistical noise and if thermal motion becomes significant. Um, as summarized on these two figures, uh, noise with temperature is a tricky mixture. All the ingredients were present to make our life miserable. Uh, it appears that the model, which was based on a very simple basis set, had great difficulties to account for off-diagonal contributions in the matrix. These contributions, these off-diagonal contributions, uh, originate from the coherent addition between different sites in the molecule. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this kind of information is mostly given by Compton profile. And the origin of the problem is confirmed here. When we compare the quality of the fit of our model in momentum space on the Compton anisotropies, where when no noise is present and when an arguably uh, important high noise is instilled in the data. So um, obviously uh, there is still room for improvement uh, but we have made great progress in recent years. Now, the joint use of position and momentum data for uh, one matrix reconstruction of real systems is within reach. And I hope to communicate very soon some further uh, advances uh, we made with uh, CISHU-U. Um, I hope I've convinced you that uh, uh, even if we are dealing with quantum objects, nevertheless, it is worth considering all dimensions of phase space and that uh, probably more than ever, both Bragg and Compton's discoveries are, are precious legacies to quantum crystallography. Uh, thanks for um, attending this webinar. I'll be happy to answer any questions during the discussion session or by email. Oh, speaking of legacies, uh, on a more macroscopic scale, can I also remind you how much both Braggs were active in position space during World War I? Uh, Henry worked on echolocations of U-boats, and um, Lawrence uh, developed uh, more uh, methods for, for determining the positions of artillery pieces uh, from the boom of their firing. And, and by now, I'm confident you can easily guess who is the inventor of the speed bump. Of course, it is Arthur Compton, who is credited with inventing the traffic control speed bump, uh, which he first installed on the campus when he was chancellor 
uh, of Washington University. Obviously, uh, he was not paying attention only to electron speed. Thanks again. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel, for this excellent lecture, which is uh, now open for questions, comments. Um, uh, so we probably will have to wait for a while until people write their questions on chat. I have some maybe more experimental question. Uh, so for each reflection you collect, uh, for each reflection you collect uh, one competent profile. Well, um, not exactly. Um, for one direction, one crystallographic one, direction. Yes. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. so, but you, it doesn't have to match with the yeah. X-ray diffraction structure okay. factors. You, do, yeah. you don't need to do that. Yeah. That's Usually, true. because I mean. Moving into um, in the, in the momentum in momentum space is uh, is quite a tricky business. You have to find those directions which are specific to some uh, specific bonds, for example. Okay, and uh, how many such profiles you need to? Uh, is how it many? related? Yeah, it's related to the number of atoms, or well, okay, when you have like. I mean, when, when you have like more than 10 or 15 atoms, it, it becomes tricky to uh, find your way in momentum space because everything is superimposed. So it's a mess. Um, so usually you deal with systems with not too many atoms, let's say. But um, depending on the symmetry of the system, um, as far as I'm aware of, uh the, the 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 highest number of content profiles which have been used is like 12 different directions but usually you're quite happy with like six and, oh. and have you checked in your simulations uh how the number of the number of profiles influence the quality of your feet yeah sometimes we we just leave aside some some profiles to see how uh, how uh, stringent uh, the number is, um, and um, I know that three tends to be the limit. It it all depends. Uh, attempts have been done to first use a large number of quantum profiles to reconstruct the momentum density in three-dimensional space, then use this three-dimensional space as an observable in itself which is cheating a little bit, right? Um, so to get a, a good reconstruction, you need plenty of directional profiles. But if you're happy uh, with using directly the content profiles, um, then, well, depending on how, how the system is is made, but three, four, five is, is a good number, I think. Professor Perlner uh, has a question, so. Yeah, I will take an advantage that my camera is on. So I, my, I have two questions. One is very basic. What do you need this one RDM for? What does it? Well, it is, uh, first of all, yeah, it's very interesting that you can reconstruct it from experimental measurements, but I wonder if you, what do you do later with it? It's just arts mm -hmm. for art's sake or? So there are, the, okay, so we, uh, there are two purposes. Um, originally, my idea was to uh, balance experiments between each other. And the one RDM is the only common factor between um, inelastic scattering experiments, which are used to, for understanding delocalized neutrons, and uh, X ray diffraction. And we know that both experiments have. Uh, their inner difficulties and biases and problems. So the idea was try to find a way to balance each other and find a way uh, to see how they would merge. They would agree to something. So, okay, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, we, um, 
as you know, uh, from the one particle density matrix, you can at least recover the, the momentum, uh, the kinetic energy. Uh, and you could possibly, but we're not at this stage yet, um, also instilled it uh, in, 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 for, for improving, for example, uh, density functional RDM-based uh, methods. Mm -hmm. And can you uh, distinguish between strongly collated? I guess you can, right? Uh, between yes, strongly uh, and weakly collated crystals. This is something which is um, which shows up um, quite strongly uh, in momentum space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been many work on uh, seeing how collated uh, system behave in momentum space and uh, how the calculations improve uh, what we can observe from the content profiles. Thank you. Christoph, I don't think you are talking to us. Yeah, please unmute, Christoph. Yes, uh, Piero is, uh, is asking about the uh, influence of temperature. Can you comment on influence of temperature? Yeah, huh. this is a nightmare. <laughs> okay, on the good side, <laughs> Compton profiles don't care about temperature. I mean, unless you go to very high temperature, but they don't really care. So momentum space is not very much affected by temperature. On the other hand, as you know, structure factors are. So what we do is that we um, instill, uh, in what, what I showed you, uh, we instill uh, one center and two centers, uh, uh, the Biweller factors in the model to try to deconvolute, uh, deconvolute from the, um, the temperature or the thermal motion. Um, okay, this is uh, another thing where we're happy to have uh, momentum space, but we, we've seen that uh, momentum space is very much affected by uh, statistics. So that's where we had trouble. Okay. Pierre, uh, Pierre Becker is asking, is saying bravo for this very clear uh, presentation. Is the CPM model around atoms still used uh, for adjusting multipolar models? No, we haven't used multipolar models yet. We are thinking about distorting, say, the uh, historical multipolar model into, um, uh, into a density matrix formulation. But um, this is not trivial. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, as I actually, I have one more. If I yes, if we still please, have time, please do. Uh, I don't want please to do. Yes. Abuse. <laughs> okay. So I was wondering if you could compare your uh, reconstructed uh, density matrix for solids, because I guess you can only do it for solids, not for single molecules in gas phase, with some uh, computational data. Because there are codes like crystal where you can, I think you can compute a correlated one RDM if you, on the yes. M2 level, but still. And how yes, would it compare yeah. with your uh, reconstructed RDM? Yeah. This would tell us about the accuracy, better than and representability condition, which is satisfied or Well, anyway, you still want to have something which is unrepresentable at the end. Yes, I agree, of course. But can we uh, compare it? Uh, my claim yeah. is that um, idempotency is probably too much of a constraint and not um, and not justified. So you impose idempotency? Uh, no, I don't. No, no OK. No, so you I, have uh, fractional uh, occupation this numbers. Is, this is something which is still in use. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Lou Massa. This is uh, this is. I mean the uh, what's the name? The Clinton equations, uh, which are actually um, very much inspired by uh, McQueen's purification scheme, mm -hmm. assume a single determinant solution. Actually, there are also purification schemes for correlated density matrices. So you, if you have non-unrepresentable density matrix which is non-idempotent you can still purify it yeah okay i don't know if it's interesting but my question was more like if you could use your density matrices uh if they are accurate enough to to be used in um, calculation or for example kinetic energy 
or it, they're still not as accurate as uh, the computationally obtained one from NPK. Yeah, that was my point, that mm -hmm. um, uh, ultimately this is something that should be done anyway, but I mean, we're not at this stage yet. Again, microphone, microphone. There is a next question being written now, so let us wait for a moment until it's finished. I do not see it. Um, okay, it's. it's Dar is uh, typing now. So in the meantime, I have another question. Um, how results depends on the basis set you are using? Because you, you say that you start always with some okay. basic basis well. set and some yeah, for, for the moment, um, um, we okay. We, we insist on having um, on, on starting from something we know. So we compute the density matrix for a system. We generate the structure factors. We generate Compton profiles, and we take these two observables as the, the ex pseudo experimental. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, when we refine the model from, uh, from these observables, we don't use the same basis set, otherwise it would be too easy. So we use a lower quality basis set. Um, and, um, and, and I mean, it depends on, on, on how the data are and, and what you start, uh, started with. But um, it is the, the off-diagonal parts are very much uh, dependent on the, on the quality of the basis set, the polarization function, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, as question of uh, Sabandar uh, uh, is related to uh, completely different uh, study. Uh, is related to uh, to the fact to the. Um, question to uh, whether quantum crystallography uh, has something in common with quasi crystals. It's uh, this is uh, dear Soban. It's uh, it's not related to this lecture. So let let's leave this uh, uh, let's uh, leave this question. Uh, uh, well, I well I must say that I don't know about uh, X ray diffraction because it's tricky. I don't know if there was there's been many uh, attempt uh, to reconstruct electron density uh, in and many state, uh, spaces, but uh, for Compton scattering, there's been uh, several studies uh, on quasi crystals, especially uh, for the Fermi surface. Okay. So one should, one could consider quasi crystal, but uh, you you may have to give up with the three D representation. Yes, you have to switch over to uh, more dimensions. Uh, yeah. So uh, once again, as I do not see more um, more um, questions and comments, uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Jean Michel, for this uh, beautiful lecture.